a book called Second Corinthians. It's in the New Testament. It's after after First Corinthians, which is after Romans, and which is after Acts, and then that's after all the Gospels. So, uh, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn there. If you don't have a Bible, I think there's one in front of you in the pew, uh, because not many people sit in the front pews. There's no Bibles in the front pews, but everyone else has a Bible in front of them. If you don't have one, you're welcome to keep that. But we're going to be in Second Corinthians chapter eight. And we're going to be looking at what Paul has to say to the Corinthians there. And if you've been with us for a while, we've been walking through this book because this book speaks to where we live now. It is a, it is a book written to a church who is struggling, written to a church in a very secular world, at a secular time. And it is a, a book that deals with a lot of the things that we deal with. It deals with how we handle suffering in this life. It deals with how, what, what our lives, what God calls our lives to look like as we depend and follow Him. It deals with those who are, who are accepting of the truth and then walking away from it. And God's calling them in His mercy and grace to come back to Him and to walk faithfully before Him. And it deals with those, an encouragement to those who have been walking with Him for a long time. And, and not sure what's what's going on or what God's doing in the pain and the sorrow and the suffering that they have in their life. It assures them that God does actually work through those things. That it's, it's, it's in the difficult areas of our life that, that God begins to shape and mold us into the person and the people that he wants us to become. Which is, namely, people who reflect the image of Jesus clearly. So all of us, purpose of the gospel is to reconcile us to God himself. And then the outworking of that gospel is that our lives begin to reveal who Jesus is to this broken and fallen world so that others may know who God is and be reconciled to himself. So we've, we're in chapter 7. Uh, we were looking at this uh, godly grief that was producing repentance that God's purpose and discipline for us is not that to shame us or to condemn us, but to shape us and mold us and change us. His, his, the, the, the sorrow that we, that we feel when it's put through a, a, a mindset on Jesus should lead us to repentance, receiving the mercy that God gives, and then following and walking right, rightly with him. So the Corinthians, these, uh, this troubled church that Paul was speaking to, uh, they had heard a message from him, a, a hard message, and they had respond, responded positively. And they responded so much as said, you know what, we repent, we're, we're, we're sorry, we, we change, we're, we don't want to follow this way anymore. And, and, and Paul's encouraging these Corinthians so after all of this theological talk, right, halfway, most of all of, this is just a side note, almost all of Paul's letters start with theology um, and then end in practice. So he starts with the main theological underpinnings of his argument, and then he goes into what do I do with, the, with what I do. At this point in the book is where Paul's moving to the, the practical aspects of what I do with the knowledge that I have. So Paul is shifting, and it seems like it's somewhat of an abrupt shift, but he moves from uh, spiritual things, spiritual discussions, uh, internal stuff, to external actions that reveal a heart that actually holds on to the truth of what I've, he's, already, he's already discussed about. So we're moving somewhat, seems like somewhat abruptly, into every preacher's favorite topic, giving. So get your pocketbooks out. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, Paul shifts very dramatically from reconciliation to God, walking uh, in, in line with the things of God, to a discussion on money. Why does he do that? We need it. We need it. We need both, Bob. Yeah. Well, he does that because spiritual maturity reveals itself in our generosity. Right? 
Money is an amoral thing. Right? There's nothing immoral or moral about it. it just, it's a tool, right? It's a, it's a tool of exchange. But the way in which we interact with it says a lot about our spiritual health. Right? Even Paul says the, uh, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's not, it's not money itself. It's the desire and the love and the chasing after it. And in how we deal with our money is deeply connected to how spiritually healthy we are. When we're walking rightly with the war, the Lord, how we're holding on to our wealth, our finances, whatever you want to call it, my chicken scratch, says a lot about my faith, my trust, my dependence on the Lord. It says a lot about how I get the knowledge and understanding of who Jesus is. So Paul, moving from all of these big, deep theological discussions that we really could have spent a lot more time on. But I don't think you guys want to stay in this book for the next two years. All, all these major concepts... Like he made him who knew no sin and be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. One of the most profound statements in all of scripture. He moves from all of that stuff to money. And he says this. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. From the severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord than by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in love, in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is, is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For that mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their needs so that their abundance may supply your need and that there may be, there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. See, Paul is speaking to the Corinthians and he's calling them to faithfulness, not only internally in what they do, but externally. He's calling them to faithfulness with their generosity. Now, just to give you a little background, Paul had sent Titus to Corinth with a severe letter to call the Corinthians back to repentance. Within the, in the process of giving that letter, which we do not have, we don't know what, exactly what it says, Titus encouraged the Corinthians to give towards the cause of what God was doing in the world at the time. Right? So this is right in the very beginning of the church. The church was just born. And some of you Bible scholars out there know that when the church was born, it was birthed in Jerusalem. And when that happened, there was this amazing thing that happened, which we believe is descriptive, not necessarily proscriptive for church but that all the people in Jerusalem felt led by the Holy Spirit to have everything in common. They sold all of their stuff. 
They sold their property. They took all the proceeds and they just distributed it amongst one another. They shared it all. And as any good um, investment guru would say, uh, that's going to make you poor. And it did. So the, the church in Jerusalem gave all of that they had to the cause of Christ, shared in common with one another at a specific time that allowed the church, when it was persecuted, to spread out across the globe. It also became, as a side note, a very beneficial thing for God and his church because all of that property was about to be seized in a couple of years when Rome came in 70 AD and wiped out everyone in Israel. So God used that for the church to expand the church, and as the church was expanding, that first birth of the church started hurting. So part of Paul's third missionary journey, which is on, he's on right now, was, was a fundraising campaign in some sense to bring back support from other churches who were well off to help out the church who gave everything that they had to the cause of Christ. So Paul's going around to all of his churches and he's, he's explaining, right? even in Galatians uh, chapter um, 2, 6 through 10, Paul talks about his commissioning from the other apostles to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And part of his commissioning is that he would remember the poor, meaning remember us back here in Jerusalem, who are still living under oppression, who still have Pharisees who are living, who are the ones who killed our king, who are still seeking to kill us. We're poor. We need help. So Paul's going around, he's going to all these churches, and he's asking. It's not just Paul's going to Corinth because they had a lot of money. He's going to everywhere and saying, hey, guys, there's a need here. God is doing something. And because of the generosity of spiritually that you've received through God, he's asking you to give of your material blessings back to his work. So that's what Paul's doing. So Paul's going around... Corinth knew this. They were giving to this. They had stopped giving to this. And then he sends Titus back to have them do this. And as, as they repent and they're eager and they're desirous and they're giving towards the, the cause in, in, in Jerusalem, evidently at some point that kind of waned away. So Paul is sending Titus back to Corinth with this letter asking them to continue and what they already started and they said they would do. And he clearly says, let your actions match up with your words. Follow through on your commitment. Show me your spiritual maturity through your generosity. And as he's saying this, he gives a description of some churches that he'd just been interacting with. The churches in Macedonia. It's a collection of churches, uh, the Macedonian church, the church of Philippi, the Thessalonian church, all of these churches that are dealing with extreme persecution and poverty become an example of generosity. So out of their lack, through an abundance of joy, they gave over and above what Paul was asking for, and even what they had. Because they understood this truth. That those who have received spiritual blessing freely give of their material blessings. Those who have received spiritual blessing freely give of their material blessings. Now, look what Paul's saying. We want you to know, brothers about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and extreme poverty hath overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they give according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. What does that mean? Paul did not encourage them to give beyond their means. They themselves said, Paul, We have to give you this. 
We want to give you this. If you don't give this to us, we're going to be very mad at you. You need to take this. And Paul, knowing their poverty, is blown away because God is doing something in them. Because they understand the truth. God has given them immeasurably more spiritually than they could ever give physically. So if God is calling them to depart with some of their resources, he will supply their lack. It is their privilege, it is their joy to get in behind what God is doing. They saw it as an act of grace. They beg, verse 4, earnestly for the favor, as the ESV says, but really the Greek is the charis. A lot of you have been around the church for a long time know what charis means. It's grace. It's what Jesus has done. Begging you for the grace to give more. Man, what a testimony. What a heart posture. What a person who gets it. I just want to get behind what the Lord's doing right now in the earth. Please, Paul, let me give. They were eager. They were willing. But this is important. They were not manipulated into it. Paul did not manipulate these people into giving of their wealth. It was a free work of the Holy Spirit and the life of these people to give up of what they had towards the program and what God was doing in the earth. Their generosity came from a deep desire to be connected to what God is doing in the earth. Generosity comes from a deep desire to serve the Lord and his purposes on the earth. So the Macedonians had their minds renewed. They were thinking rightly about where they were in history. What reality was. Kind of like on a similar vein of what we spoke about earlier today. That our hearts aren't always there. Our emotions aren't always where God, the truth of God, of God is. But these people, they were there. What is truth? This world is passing away. Everything we see is a temporary thing except for the souls of people. There's a God, a sovereign God, who created all things, who made all things, who created us to be in relationship with him, and we sinned against him. And then all of their descendants sin against him. Sin is in the world, corrupting and breaking everything. But that same sovereign God saw that problem sent his son, came and lived a life we could not live, died a death that we deserve, and then rose again from the dead so that we can have the life that he deserves. And then that same God rose again from the dead and ascended to heaven and promised to come back. And he's going to come back and restore all things. That all the brokenness of this world will be made new. It would all change. He would restore everything to the way it's supposed to be. And at that state is the state we live for eternity. If we're in him. So if that's where we're going and it's secure, and it doesn't matter what I do because my value, my worth, my acceptance before God has nothing to do with my behavior. It has everything to do with what Jesus has done. He's done it all. So I can't lose it. So that God also who has done everything to save me promises to provide all of my needs. Jesus himself, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness 
and all of these things will be added upon you. My God knows what I need to eat. He knows I need shelter. He knows I need protection and safety. And he says, seek after what I'm doing in the world, and I will provide all these things for you. Many of you know that experientially. You've, you've known what it was to make a hard choice. And say, Lord, I'm not sure what you're going to do with this, but my heart is yours, my life is yours, my stuff is yours. I trust for you to provide. And that generosity came out of a deep desire to serve Jesus, what he's doing on this world. Right? Paul even says, look, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. Look, Corinthians, you can say that you love God, that you love his, what he's doing, that you're all on board. But what you do with your finances really tells the truth. I think it was uh, Howard Hendricks says, you know, uh, um, I forget how the quote goes. Um, so a lot of people can say how spiritual they are, but show me their pocketbook and I'll tell you how spiritual someone is. Right. Should prove by the earnestness of what you desire. Put your money where your mouth is. And he says this, For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus, who owns everything, Gave it up so that we could lay claim to the inheritance that he has. So that the truth of Ephesians 2 that I read this morning when we started, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly places with every spiritual blessing, could be true. Jesus did that. Have the same type of mind among yourself. I love what Gregory um, Nazan of Nazanius says, as an early church father. He says, Christ was made poor that we through his poverty might be rich. He took the form of a servant that we might regain liberty. He descended that we might be exalted. He was tempted that we might overcome. He was despised that he might fill us with glory. He died that we might be saved. He ascended to draw to himself those lying prostrate on the ground through sin's stumbling block. And when you really understand the depth of what God's done and the gift that you've received, the clenched hands on your stuff are easy to relax. So Paul, speaking to them, is saying, look, Corinthians, you committed to something. God's doing something. I want to see you follow through in what you've done. I don't want you to be embarrassed by the other churches. Because Corinth was a very wealthy place. I mean, they had a lot of money. It's like if... God was writing a letter to the church in America and then talking about what the church in Nigeria was doing. Overabundantly blessed. And he's telling them, look, get involved in what God's doing. But he's not manipulating them. He's not using this story as a story of guilt. He's not saying, hey, Look how good they are. You guys need to be good too. If he did, he would say, look what they did. I'm commanding you to do what they did. You got to do this. There's no language here at all of Paul saying, I'm commanding you to do this. He's saying, I'm giving you my judgment. I'm saying this would be a good thing for you. I'm calling you to faithfulness. Here is an opportunity for you 
to follow through in your walk and your growth and matur- maturity. You're missing it. I want you to get it. And I want you to get involved in what God's doing. It's, it's a shame because this kind of discussion in the church, uh, it, it's, it's been so harmful for a lot of people. I mean, if you're new with us, you might be asking, okay, when's he going to be passing around a plate? Probably after this sermon. We don't, we don't do that here. We have a box back here, or a couple boxes. Giving is a deeply spiritual thing. It's an act of worship for me to give back to the Lord of what he's given to me. I am not called to hoard. Now, I am called to be a good steward. Having a lot of money is not a bad, bad thing. God's not calling us all to poverty. But he does call us to be obedient to what he leads us into. So we have boxes there. You guys are extremely generous. It shows itself week in, week out. Through all the needs that come up. We're, we're the number one church uh, we, where we raise the most funds out of any church in Delaware for Door of Hope. Two years in a row. You guys are, are generous. You get it. But if you're new with us, the reason we don't pass this plate around is because that's a stumbling block. A lot of people come into church and they're like, all it is is they just want my money. They just come in asking, give me, give me, give, give. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Could, could write a modern rap song about churches giving. <laughs> and so it's not our priority to speak on it all the time. Because the priority is that you would find relationship and forgiveness in the loving God of the universe. But for those of us who know him, What we do with our finances really does matter. And it has nothing to do with the amount. It has everything to do with the intentions of the heart. Paul doesn't guilt them. He doesn't... He doesn't try to manipulate them. He just says, look, here is an opportunity and see what your brothers have done. Proving that the amount of money I have has nothing to do with my generosity. In fact, God can even take my lack and make it abundant. It's more of, do I, am I concerned for the things of God? Do I want to get involved in what the Lord is doing? Does Jesus have control of my wealth? Is Jesus Lord of my finances? So he ends this chapter and saying, thanks be to God who put in the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. For he not only accepted our appeal, but he himself is very earnest in going out to you of your own accord. With him we are sending the brother who's famous among all the churches for his preaching in the gospel. And not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us. For the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill. We take this course that no one should blame us about this generous gift that's being administered to us. For if we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. And with them we are sending our brother, whom we have tested and found earnest in many matters. But is more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. For Titus... As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. 
So give proof before the churches of your love and of our boasting about you to these men. Paul's connecting their giving to the work that God is doing by sending someone who is extremely skilled in presenting the gospel. It's not just for fundraising. It is for the advancement of the gospel in the world. It is for the building up of the unity of the body that these fractured churches all over the place are sharing things one in another, supporting one another. Even he, he, he talks about giving using the, the example of manna in the wilderness. God provided manna so that anyone who gathered a lot or anyone who had to gather a little all had what they need. And then at the end of the day, or the next day, it was worms. It expired. So we all gathered what we need. We all lived in dependence. We all followed what the Lord had for us. And that same mentality, that same work that God did, He's able to do in us when we give up to Him of our finances. Now, I will say, this was a unique time in history. We don't have an apostle right now going around collecting for the various churches amongst the world. We are not called to give of our funds to this giant church organization program that's going on. This is for God's purposes in Jerusalem for the early church. The principle doesn't for us doesn't move from there to there. But the principle for us does go to how does my understanding of the gospel move me towards the use of my finances? Am I living generously? What does my generosity say about my spiritual maturity? What does my generosity say about my spiritual maturity? So there's not anywhere in the Bible or in the New Testament that Jesus brings up or Paul or one of his apostles says anything about a command for a tithe. There is a lot about the use of money. The amount has little to nothing to do uh, with importance to the Lord than the heart behind the amount. We're not restricted with the 10%, meaning that's not all the Lord wants. We are restricted with the Holy Spirit moving in our hearts to give towards what God is doing. Whether that is 5% or 95%. So I can't stand up here and tell you, what are you called to give? How are you to be generous? We got more debt to pay down. We got a big church project to go towards. No, it's it's not about that. The question for you is, are you being faithful to the Lord with what he has given to you? Are you living open hands with the wealth that the Lord has provided for you? Are you following willingly to to give of what he's given to you? Towards what he's doing on the earth. Now this is complicated because I feel like there could be a lot of talking about what would be a good cause to give to Or what is a bad cause to give to? Bad cause, anyone who's saying, seed your money here so God can give you more. And there are a lot of people out there who do that. We will talk about the benefits of giving next week, chapter 9, where a lot of people use that passage, and it is misused. 
Most people are trying to get you to give so that you can get more back are speaking to a sinful desire in your heart and tempting you to try to manipulate God for material gain. That's not what God wants to do. God wants you to live with an open hand with what he has. God wants you to trust him that if he asks you to give, he will supply. God wants you to live in dependence. Whether you have enough for this week in your bank account, or you've created a financial engine that provides for you for the rest of your life. Either way, it is a heart that desires him, his purposes, his will, his work. And I'm robbing myself. I'm deceiving myself. If I'm hoarding what God's given and not giving it freely to what he's doing. There's your treasure, there's your heart. Amen. So where's my treasure? Is it my wealth or is it the Lord's? You have to answer that question. I can't answer it for you. But it is a good thing to be in the house of the Lord today.